Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Google Hangout, uh, Not Falling For It, How to Challenge Toxic Media Messages About Food, Weight, and Body Image. And we're really excited at the National Eating Disorders Association to be hosting this Hangout in conjunction with National Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Um, this year's theme is I Had No Idea, and we're going to be talking today about the influence of media, the impact of media, and what we can do um, in terms of media literacy and also media activism. And we have a stellar, stellar panel. I'm really excited for all of them to be part of this conversation. And I, I want to just get started, and we can move right into the discussion. Um, I'm going to first start out with Allison Epstein. Can you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Allison Epstein, and I'm the managing editor for Adios Barbie, which is a body image website founded way back in the 90s that provides resources for positive body image, eating disorder recovery, and body image of all kinds of different identities, including race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, all kinds of bodies. We're all, we're all about that discussion. So I've been working there for about two years. And um, I got started working with Adios Barbie because I was looking for a way to work through my own eating disorder recovery. So that's the lens that I'm coming through body image activism at. And I'm just really happy to be here and talk with everybody tonight. Thanks so much, Allison. Um, next, we have Melissa Fabella. Melissa. Hi, how are you? Thanks I'm for being here. part of this. Yeah, I'm really excited. I am here currently representing Everyday Feminism, which is an online magazine dedicated to helping folks apply feminist theory to their everyday lives. Um, but I'm also a PhD student in human sexuality studies where my research interest <clears throat> is in um, how effective psychoeducational interventions around sexuality for eating disorder recovery patients um, are. Uh, and yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Melissa. And um, next up, we have Pia Pio. Thank you for, for being here. And can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. Um, I'm Pia, and I'm a founder and editor at Audios Barbie. And I have I've actually was an adult in the 90s, so that's when we started the website. <laughs> it is a um, body image site, but it's also an, a site that looks at media literacy and identity. So you know, in addition to women having issues with their bodies as long with men, we look at just that, what it's like to have a body that is not uh, in the mainstream white culture, period. So what it, we deal specifically with issues of race, gender identity, and other issues like that, as well as body image. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this conversation. And, you know, I think when we talk about the media's connection to eating disorders specifically, it's a very complex connection. And today we want to talk about some of the ways that media can damage our health and inhibit eating disorder recovery. And um, some of the themes that we're going to talk about today are the importance of media literacy, as I mentioned, um, what we can all do to fight back against these very toxic messages and images, and really advocate for change, um, both within ourselves and as media activists and media makers. Um, and I think that's going to be a really important part of the discussion, too. We really want to focus on solutions as well as really identifying the complexities of the problem and the connection between media and the epidemic of eating disorders and body image issues. You know, Melissa, I want to start with you because we've talked um, a lot about the connection between yeah. media and eating disorders. And, you know, it's not a simple connection. We're not talking about blaming the, mis the media in a very simplistic way. You know, we don't look at pictures of um, thin models and suddenly spiral into eating disorders. But there is a connection, and I think it's really important to talk about um, how we make that connection. And I know that you have some very strong opinions about this, and I'd like to throw it over to you to start off that discussion. Sure. You know, I've seen a post going around Tumblr lately that I really like that says something something to the effect of diet culture didn't cause me to have an eating disorder, but it's making it hard as hell to recover from one. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really good point. I think people like to play the media blame game because it's easy. And I think when we talk about something as complicated and difficult and upsetting and possibly traumatic as an eating disorder, people want to find a really easy um cause so that they can find a really easy solution. 
and the media feels like it can be that. Um, and so people kind of like jump to that conclusion, which I think is a little bit dangerous because it it only uh, takes the social kind of part of the eating disorder and doesn't really talk about the biological aspect or the psychological aspect um, of eating disorder development, which, you know, we have to look at, if we're going to look at it, like you said, it's a complex thing and we need to look at that as something as holistic as possible. But I think that we have a problem in the media when it comes to what's being represented and how people are feeling about that and not giving people the media literacy skills that they need to be able to deal with that in a way that's healthy and productive. Um, and we're not really giving people the ability to deconstruct the messages that they're getting. So they're just kind of internalizing it and not realizing that they're internalizing it. Um, and I think that can cause people a lot of, a lot of issues, even if I don't, you know, think that it causes someone to have an eating disorder. I think it causes people to have a lot of insecurities and they think that that can exacerbate an eating disorder and it can make eating disorders really difficult to move on from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what about, uh, I'll throw this over to you, Pia, to talk about um, some of the challenges of eating disorder recovery in a space where we're exposed to so many messages that are under the umbrella of health that aren't actually so healthy. And, you know, what about this prevalence and, you know, non-stop messaging around dieting? And how, what is the influence of that? And, you know, how have you seen that in your work as a body image activist and media literacy activist? Um, I think that this guys that of healthy messaging of dieting, oh, I lost 15 pounds and I'm, I'm healthy, it actually starts sending the message that the only people who are healthy are ultra thin mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily always the case, obviously. And it also sends a message that people who are unhealthy are not thin. Um, and it's, it creates this cycle of judgment around weight. And all of a sudden, people are doctors when they're talking to you or judging you about your size because this message of healthy equals thin or, the, or strong is the new thin, that um, there's something wrong with us if we don't fit into that ideal. Mm -hmm. And we all have different bodies. We all have different experiences. Eating disorders are psychological, and at the same time, um, it is it is influenced, as Melissa spoke, on some level to the cultural messages we're getting, which are pounded into our heads by the media. Um, so even if we are in recovery, it's really hard because the people that care about us, practitioners, are telling us one thing, but then we go out into the world and so many messages are telling us the opposite. So it is really hard on healing. It is really hard to have a culture that's so diametrically opposed to self-care and intuitive knowledge about ourselves, about healing. It's, it's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it also plays into other, other non-stereotypical eating disorders. You know, we think eating disorders mean anorexia. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it also adds to the shame that comes with being an overeater or being other kinds of folks who have eating disorders. And it is that shame that perpetuates um, the, the blame, the self-blame, the self-hatred, the lack of self-esteem that contributes to the disorders. So it is. It's very, very complex. And um, I was just thinking when Melissa was talking that, you know, Karen Carpenter, died of an eating disorder and there was no social media then there were no videos online there weren't even you know the kind of movies you saw a movie that lasted in the movie theater for months at a time um, and so that idea of what is ideal and healthy is so different now than then but yet the disorders still were were available then so it is a very um, complicated issue and media is a part of it but I do think that the focus on health needs to change on what that looks like and the image of health needs to change mm -hmm. and the image of beautiful needs to change as well. Yeah, wow. Well, you raised so many important points that I want to um, delve into a little more, Pia. Particularly, you know, we talk about um, how the media influences us and impacts and in, um, in terms of this 
obsessive focus on thinness and the thin ideal. Um, but another another area that I think is really important to talk about in the eating disorders realm is how the media privileges certain eating disorder experiences and certain eating disorder stories, um, which is exactly what you're talking about in terms of people who feel like their eating disorder doesn't count or they, the suffering that they're experiencing doesn't fit into this typical image of you know, what we see as an eating disorder represented in the media. Um, I'm wondering, Allison, if you could talk about that a little bit and, you know, how the media privileges certain eating disorder experiences over others and what the impact of that is. Yeah, I mean, I think the impact of that is that it makes it so much more difficult for people who don't fit that really, really small narrative box to actually feel like they deserve to go get treatment or to seek help, reach out to people, because it feels like, you know, you're just complaining about not being able to lose weight. It's not like you deserve the help that you'd be able to get if you saw that eating disorder did not all look like they do in the movies. Because I think if we think about what an eating disorder looks like, we'll think about the covers of tabloids in the Lifetime movies where you get your late 20s white woman who goes into an inpatient facility because she has anorexia and then she comes out six months later and everything is perfect. Mm -hmm. And that is not the only way to have an eating disorder. It's not to say that that doesn't matter and we should stop talking about that completely. But there are just so many different ways that eating disorders can manifest themselves. Um, I think one of the best things that I've seen on Tumblr, obviously we're going to spend a lot of time on eating disorder Tumblr, but just that like you see with a lot of different images, you can't tell who has an eating disorder just by looking at them which is really true because you don't necessarily need to be extremely underweight to be dealing with, with an eating disorder or disordered eating, maybe not necessarily under one of the mainstream definitions. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, sometimes the definitions of eating disorders themselves can make it more difficult to recognize different problems as eating disorders because often they involve weight components. For anorexia, you need to have a certain BMI to be considered underneath that umbrella, which is strange to me because it's telling people that if you're not thin enough, you don't have an eating disorder, mm -hmm. which seems like a terrible message to have. But I, I just think that it's really important to represent the whole spectrum of eating disorders instead of just the one mainstream narrative that we're getting mm -hmm. because it just really privileges, I, I'm sorry, because it really privileges the single story and marginalizes all these other groups of people who need the help and need the recognition but aren't able to get it because they don't believe that they deserve it. Yeah, that's that's such an important point and actually it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to talk about a project that we have um, going right now that's a partnership with Melissa actually called Marginalized Voices and Melissa I'll let you talk about the background of this but a lot of it really did stem from this frustration with the you know this dominant narrative about um, eating disorders and who gets eating disorders and how limited and how limiting that is so can you talk a little bit about that and how how that project came about and where we are with it and going with it yeah, I got into this um, little groove at one point where I wanted to read a lot of eating disorder memoirs, and I picked up so many eating disorder memoirs, and I was reading these, and I was like, there's a really common theme here, which is exactly what Allison said, which is that all of these stories follow the exact same narrative arc. Like, there is no difference here. They're pretty much all the same, and the ones that I've read that uh, were, were different, that took, like, a different approach or had a different, you know, narrator were ones that, like, I had to dig to find. They weren't the ones that, you know, Amazon was recommending to me, for example. So I started to get really frustrated because I felt like there are so many stories that aren't being told because all of the stories that are being told are coming from one point of view and one kind of experience. And just like Allison said, those stories are still important, and we need to talk about them. And I think that, like, as myself, as, like, a white woman recovering from an eating disorder, from a restrictive eating disorder, like, I fall into that narrative, too. And, like, I'm not saying that my story isn't important. It's important to me, and it's important to the people that love me. But, like, is my story the one that has to continue being told? Not really. So I wanted to kind of create something. I felt like with um, 
the work that I do with everyday feminism, which is like really all about, you know, marginalized voices and then any kind of partnership that I've had with Nita that I really wanted to make something, I wanted to do something um, to talk about this. So we came up with this project, Marginalized Voices Project, where people from all sorts of different um, identities, marginalized identities, and that's either marginalized socially um, or marginalized within eating disorder stories. So for example, one of the stories that was submitted is from a woman who's a mother of two children, she's older, and she struggles with an eating disorder. And that's not something that we talk about either, is like moms, you know, middle-aged moms with eating disorders we don't talk about either. Um, and that's a really good perspective to make sure that we're addressing that. Um, so yeah, so we started collecting these stories from people um, with marginalized experiences, and it was really cool, and we got a lot of submissions. Um, at this point, we're kind of in the process of, all right, we've narrowed down, you know, the stories that we, you know, like the most, I guess, is really what it kind of comes down to, between, like liking them, and then also, um, you know, that they, they represent a wide range of experiences. And now working toward filling in any gaps that we have. Of course, there's always going to be gaps or, you know, impossible to have every single experience. Um, but trying to fill in the gaps that we see and also starting to work toward, all right, now how are we going to publish this um, collection that we create? And it's really exciting, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it, too. And I think, you know, clearly there is such a need um, for these stories to be told, but also you know, to give people a space to explore these different areas of eating disorder experience that, that have really been, you know, marginalized and we don't hear about them in mainstream media. And, you know, one of the most common things I hear, I do a lot of work with young people here at NIDA, and I hear so often that there's this extreme frustration that people don't see themselves reflected in the media they consume. And that this has a huge impact on poor body image, on the development of eating disorders, and the, certainly in, in the recovery process. You know, this total lack of body diversity, of diversity in general. Um, and it's something that we really need to take seriously. And I know that this has been um, an, an area of focus for, for you and your work, Pia, and I would love to talk and hear what you have to say about this topic and the importance of advocating for diversity in media and body diversity in media. Well, if you don't see yourself in the media, um, it's pretty easy to feel like you don't exist. And that's one of the issues that people face, that um, their life, their story, their narrative is not important. Um, one of the things we started in the in the 90s was basically looking at how one of the articles we wrote was demystifying the the idea that black girls can't get eating disorders and um, one of the things that's pretty sad about that is that still there aren't a lot of experts around girls of color and eating disorders so if the field doesn't have very many experts, I don't really know how we expect the media to represent those experiences. So I, personally, I think that there's, this, there's a societal shift that needs to happen, a cultural shift that needs to happen, That's including creating the dialogue by showing those stories. It's pretty easy to change the narrative in you know, a lifetime for a television movie and have the character be a person of color. Um, that needs to change um, because some of the narratives are very similar. You know, I danced ballet when I was younger, and we had girls of color who danced ballet who developed eating disorders. Um, that's not necessarily a traditional narrative. It might be, but you know, ballet is a just a warm bath for <laughs> eating disorders <laughs> to spring out of. But um, I think, in general, and specifically to eating disorders it helps to see people like you suffering because you can take a lesson from that character. You might not, you can, it, it, I guess what I'm saying is um, it's easier to look outside yourself and to see yourself. That's why media literacy is really important because when you can deconstruct and analyze what's happening in the media, you can actually identify without it being so close to home that you're going to put your blinders up. And mm -hmm. so that's what's really important about media representations is they are teaching tools. And so the more diverse they are, I think the more 
people can relate to themselves, but the more they can relate to other people. Um, and so, for instance, I had had an episode of disordered eating, and I didn't even know it was an episode of disordered eating until I started talking to people who had eating disorders. Um, that wouldn't have been possible if um, I hadn't been doing the work at Audios Barbie. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, and I, I I think you raise um, such a crucial point around this whole idea of, of experts, and you know, I think that that's something that you know, we need to take a hard look at within the eating disorders field as well. And this has come up, and I encourage everyone also, we did a fabulous Google Hangout um, called Marginalized Voices, in which we really talked about um, the panelists really explored the idea of leadership. And, you know, it's not just about inclusion. It's about inviting people to tables of leadership. And, you know, when we talk about media, you know, redefining who, you know, who gets called an expert, you know, and looking at, um, I think, the, the production of media and putting media production into the hands of, of everyone. And that's one of the, I think, a nice transition to talk about where we are with social media. And a lot of times, I mean, I hear all the time about the dangers of social media, and that's a real danger, and I think we can talk about that and some of the negative impacts of social media. Um, but I'd also like to just talk about some of the powerful, positive impact of social media and of you know, online media in general, and sort of putting putting the public these publishing platforms into people's hands. And you know, we see there's a huge um, there's so many like opportunities to promote diversity and body positivity. And you know, we're seeing that all over the place. I think that that's something that I would love for each of you um, to comment on. And maybe we'll talk about you know pros cons, and each of you can kind of. Uh, weigh in on that on that um, angle because I think this this social media piece is really really important when we talk about media um, we have to be talking about social media as well so Allison um, I'll let you start off and then we can just sort of have each of the panelists um, comment on that you know pros and cons of social media as it relates to body image and, and eating disorders yeah um, I'm gonna start with the cons because I like to end on a positive note so <laughs> um, I mean there's a lot of risks involved with social media just because there's less moderation involved. You can be having a terrible day in recovery and you just really don't want to think about anything in a positive light. You pound out an angry blog post and you throw it up there and then three weeks later someone stumbles across it and then it can set off some kind of negative reaction. It can be triggering. It can be any kind of things like that. And it's also wonderful because no one's telling you what you can and can't say. But at the same time, there's that that risk that you're putting out content, maybe not thinking about it as carefully as you could, and that's why we say don't read the internet comments. Is because there's really no filter there. It's just the the worst of everybody can come out onto social media, and if you're in a, a fragile place in an eating disorder recovery, that can be really can be really difficult. There are also just opportunities for Individuals put out, you know, inspiration, putting out pictures of uh, extremely, extremely thin bodies and glorifying the the eating disorder ideal for restrictive disorders or for compulsive exercise. You see a lot of fitspiration as the alternative, which is just, you know, um, pictures of people ex who have been working out a lot, exercise, and motivational quotes around that that are at the same time really, I don't want to say, obviously they're not motivational, but more just to make you feel bad about yourself for not working hard enough. And so it's, there's definitely a need for social media awareness to know what, what dark, deep corners of the internet you need to stay away from in the space that you're at and then kind of self-censoring because the internet is so huge no one's going to be able to do that for you. And that was something that I knew I, that I needed to work on a lot in my own recovery was just knowing I could look at this and I kind of want to deep down in my weird train of thought but I know that for me it's a good idea not to and to just keep in mind what kind of social media will be helpful at certain times. But at the same time, like I said earlier, because social media isn't moderated and there's no big corporate agenda behind what you're going to put on Twitter, it opens up the, the door for people to say things that mainstream media might not otherwise encourage. Because there really is a social agenda behind 
the kinds of stories and the kinds of bodies and the kinds of images that we're allowed to see in the media. It's not by accident that we're only seeing extremely thin bodies and we're only seeing the narratives of white, cisgendered, straight men in all of our media. But on the internet, it's really, really easy to start up a blog or start a Tumblr or start an Instagram and start sharing media that you know that you want to see and represent people that aren't represented in other areas. So, I mean, that's the reason that I got involved in activism is because the bar for getting involved is so much lower. You don't have to have social and political clout. You don't need the money to get involved in mainstream publishing. You can have an idea and have a voice and find people who also have that idea and start putting out media that's more helpful rather than just what sells. Yeah, that's. I think that's really powerful. And um, Melissa, obviously, social media is a huge part of your activism and your work. Um, can you speak to how it relates to this field, and um, you know, both in terms of the risks as well as the you know the positive potential in, in as a recovery tool, as a way of um, promoting body diversity, all of these areas that you're very involved in in your work. Sure. I think one of the biggest issues we have with social media is that we often forget that it's media, that it's not real life. I find that uh, people have really strange ideas around uh, just what's coming out on social media and, and the fact that social media, the way that we represent ourselves on social media, everyone, is carefully crafted. And for example, Instagram. I might post a selfie on Instagram, and people might be like, Melissa, this is a really hot selfie. And, like, it is, but I took 50 pictures, then I cropped it, then I put a filter on it. Like, it's still not really what I look like walking around day to day. You know what I mean? Like, I made sure it was, like, the right angle for my face, you know, and everything. And people are just aren't thinking about that um, when they're looking at media, uh, particularly social media. The fact that it's just like any other kind of media, it's still somewhat manipulated. Even on Twitter, like, I use Twitter, but there's a certain part of my personality that I put on Twitter. Like, there's parts of me that I don't put on Twitter. Like, it's not me as a whole person. Uh, and I think we forget that sometimes. And I think that that can be really damaging when people are, you know, just scrolling through their Instagram even. And they see all these people, wow, like, oh, this, this is this real life, you know, picture of this person and they always look gorgeous and it's like well maybe yes but also it's Instagram and I think that that can be that can be a problem um, but I also think that social media is such an amazing way to connect with people and I I think you know I hear older generations that like aren't up with social media um, always talking down about it about how like now we don't make real connections with people anymore and stuff like that and it's like Social media is like a game changer for a lot of people, for finding connections with people, for finding um, people with similar interests or similar struggles or people, other activists and learning from people. I feel like information overload can be a problem. It's not always great. But I think that the fact that all that information is out there for you if you want it and that there are all these people that you can connect with and meet, like the amount of people, I mean, I've met all of you on social media, right? So like... And I like to think that these relationships are fantastic, therefore social media is great just because of the three of you, but in reality I think that, you know, social media can be such a good thing and it can really, really help people. And something I've been trying to do a lot um, this year is really focus a lot of my activism on that like one-on-one -on -one individual level with people. Like, what do you need? You, one person, and let me see what I can do for you. And I think social media makes that possible. It makes it possible to find each other. Um, you can't just go into a room and look around and go, who's the one with an eating disorder? And, like, try to figure it out. Like, how can I help you? You know, like, that would be weird to do in real life, right? Like, could you imagine? <laughs> but social media makes it possible to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. And I think that we should give it its due credit in that vein. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. I love what you said about um, social media literacy and really being able to, I mean, we're at a point now in, um, you know, in terms of early intervention and prevention work and looking at, um, you know, retouching and, you know, the idea that we need to educate people, young people in particular, about 
the fact that every pretty much everything we're looking at is a digital illusion and you know these images in magazines the images that we're seeing of models you know they're they're not real but i don't think we've quite gotten to that point where we're really taking that angle and you know applying it to social media and it's not quite the same but there is definitely a, a media literacy piece that needs to happen there and um, Pia I wonder if you can comment on that and then maybe share your other thoughts about social media since this is something that comes up so often um, in our work. Um, well let's see um, back in the late 90s 2000s um, the Alliance for Media Literate America was focusing on media literacy and they've changed their name to NAMLI now but um, they now focus on digital literacy. So that includes mm -hmm. what you see on your iPhones, that includes you know what you see on your watch, like all these different things and it's gonna the, the way we receive information about each other and the way we t put out information about ourselves is rapidly changing and I think that's going to be something that's hard to keep up with, but we really need to stay focused on it. Um, I know for myself, like one thing that has come up is that even people Photoshop their their photos of themselves. So you look on people's Instagrams and they Photoshop themselves. Um, it's hard to find a photographer that will do a portrait of you that won't insist on Photoshopping because it makes them look good if you look good. So I think that mm -hmm. digital literacy is really, really important. And that, like Melissa said, when you see someone, even a friend on, on Instagram, or they're, they're completely manufactured and manipulating themselves, we've learned those tools from the masters. Um, mm -hmm. And I look for a revolution where we actually rebel against that and there's a movement where we share share who we are without using those tools and I hope I hope it's coming you know that's sort of maybe something a uh, new campaign we can work on together um, but it is it is it's very insidious it's very insidious because what we see is not reality yeah we we just did a poll on um, Proud to be me, which is Nita's youth website, and we asked that question of whether you've ever um, altered an image of yourself that you you put on posted on social media. And I think at this point, it's more than three quarters um, when we close the poll. So it's it's a, a huge majority of people are altering their photos before posting them to social media. So this is you know this is happening all the time, and I don't think it's something that we necessarily think about, um, you know, I, that is really important to consider when we're looking critically at um, media images, including the images that we're seeing via social media. Um, I think the normalization of that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's that normal to take, like I have really big um, irises because I'm on a medication <laughs> that makes my irises big. And so in every picture, I, my eyes glow in the dark like a demon. It's just normal for me to, you know, do the thing on the eyes, but that's Photoshop. You know, it is a form of Photoshopping, and pretty soon, making your lips red will just be normal. It won't even be considered Photoshop. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, there's a there's a slow normalization of manipulating yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's really become we 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 take it for granted. I think that this has become so normal, but to be able to step out of that and talk about this aspect of media literacy and, and particularly how it relates to you know to eating disorder to the eating disorders field and you know promoting um, self acceptance and really looking at that connection I think is, is, is key so really important point um, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, how we can challenge media and you know, what are some strategies? I think, you know, oftentimes it's it's overwhelming. You know, we're just faced with this like constant stream of toxicity. And, you know, where can we actually step in as activists and advocate for, for real change? Um, and and I you all are doing really 
powerful, wonderful things in this realm. So I'd love to hear more about your work specifically and you know your ideas for, for where we go from here um, and what do we all need to be thinking of as, as people who care about making change to the media landscape. Um, I'm going to start with you, Allison. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the most important way to get involved in media literacy is just to start by meeting yourself and meeting other people where they are. Because I think there's this misconception around media literacy, at least when I first heard about it, that you have to just cut out all of the media that has negative messaging in it and you have to just only surround yourself with the perfect media and if it shows unrealistic bodies or it has stuff that's not representing marginalized communities, you can't watch that because it's bad and if you watch it you're a bad activist. And about at that point there's really no media you can expose yourself to. What, maybe one show, listen to three songs and read a book all year. And that's, that's not going to help anybody out and no one's going to want to get on board with that. So what we try to do at Adios Barbie and what I try to do in my own writing, in my own life, is start with what you like and then look at what you like through a more critical lens, finding out what's working well in media and celebrating media when it does things that's good for us and then also holding it accountable when it starts spreading messages that are harmful or leaves out stories that are very important. Like, for example, I'm a really strong fan of Game of Thrones, and there are a lot of problematic aspects in Game of Thrones that I wish I'd be able to change all on my own, but it doesn't mean that I have to just throw out all of that because there are a lot of unrealistic body types and sexism in that show. It's just holding that show accountable. What, what we do at Adios Barbies, we will publish articles quite frequently about media like that that's troubling and is probably not helpful to watch and just getting awareness about things that should be changed and that's a really good place to bring social media back in is because campaigns about awareness for things like that on Twitter or on um, petition websites or Facebook that really does make a difference it's where networks are looking for buzz about what's working, what people like, what people are talking about and if you're celebrating this is working really well, this is great, I want to see more of this, networks on TV will actually notice that. They pay attention because they want ratings. So just speaking out when you see something that is, is good and is promoting messages you believe in, and then also holding that media to a, a higher standard than maybe we're ordinarily used to. It doesn't have to be on a big scale, you don't have to take down the TV networks all by yourself, but every time you speak out, you're adding your voice to that sea of people who are who are paying more attention to media and every little bit will make a difference in the long run. Thanks, Nelson. Um, what about you, Melissa? What are your suggestions for those who want to make some change and um, stand up for more positive messages, images, and media? I really like what Allison was saying around almost like unrealistic expectations for activists because I do see that happening a lot and I think something that I noticed happening a lot in the feminist blogosphere which um, has pros and cons is a lot of people are really good at pointing out what's wrong with the world and that's awesome it's a really good first step not a whole lot of people are talking about what to do about it right and mm -hmm. I think a lot of reasons why, like Allison was saying, that people sometimes feel um, like they, they reject the notion of body positive or media literacy like activism is because it seems like a really negative space sometimes. Like Allison was saying, if you don't do this, 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 and that, then you're a bad activist. Or it's just, here's everything that's wrong, here's everything that's wrong, here's everything that's wrong, and like, who wants to be in a space like that? So I know that's something at Everyday Feminism that we do, um, which is kind of what we've like, you know, built our whole thing around, is giving people, okay, here's something, here's something you can do right now. Here are five things you can do today that will change something uh, oppressive. And I think that giving people tools is so underrated. Giving people the tools to do something um, is really, really powerful. Point out to them what's wrong and then give them something that they can do about it. And I think we forget that part. Um, but something else that I wanted to talk about, though, is also just... 
being being comfortable doing things on a small scale. Because I think a lot of people feel like they can't be activists. Like I get people asking me that, how do you become an activist? I'm like, I don't talk to a person. Done. Activism. Like it's not, you don't have to be running for president. You know, it's, it's not like you have to be doing this huge scale movement to make a change. And I honestly feel like the most powerful, impactful activism that I do ends up being just those one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, like the fact that at this point in my life, my dad will call me just to ask me, hey, I saw this thing, Do you, is this racist? Or hey, I saw this thing, I think it's sexist. I saw this thing, like, can you tell me what you think about it? You know, and the fact, like, I've seen my dad's growth, you know, just from me always trying to point stuff out um, in a way that meets him, you know, 60-something-year-old man, like, where he's at. Like, I think, I think that that's really powerful, and it's not something that people do enough, or even, like, starting a hashtag and like having a conversation and okay maybe you're not going to get this huge reach and you're not going to be on a list of the most feminist important body positive hashtags of the year but <laughs> that sounded like I was like throwing shade I actually wasn't just <laughs> <laughs> you were actually on that, that list <laughs> Melissa <laughs> <laughs> no I'm just kidding I did that I um, but <laughs> not that you're referring to anything. <laughs> oh, I really wasn't, and I really it sounded kind of like I was. So I just want to be clear. <laughs> but I think um, it's fine if you do something that's more small scale, because the people who you affect, you are going to affect in ways like you can save lives. Like that's that's huge when you think about that. That you can help people. Whenever I get messages from people that say following you on Tumblr has helped me recover from my eating disorder, like that's mind-blowing and if I only got one message like that in my entire life like my life would have been very well lived you know to have that kind of effect on a person and I think we forget that you know those small-scale actions make a really big difference in people's lives yeah that's powerful and you have a one-on-one -on -one impact and it, it really does make a difference in a way that you, you, you know you personally can experience and and I think you're absolutely right about how overwhelming this term activist you know a lot of people I think are very overwhelmed by that concept and think like oh I have to start this whole you know international campaign or take down a you know global corporation and you know it, 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 it can start small and I think that's where it can be very very impactful as you as you pointed out um, Pia what, what do you think about this as far as um, you know tools and strategies for for change what what would you recommend to those who are who are watching this this hangout um, well I think the, the point was raised which is really important it's important to raise awareness and so with that sometimes comes anger frustration it comes from people being pissed off and my background is in youth development and youth media and what I've learned is when you're working with youth and trying to build power with youth to create have them become activists you can't leave them in the anger because that just is going to spiral down you know the the goal of empowerment activism is to have the activist develop to a point where they build their own self-esteem and their own sense of power so that raising awareness to the point where everybody's depressed is just step one um, the next step is to identify resources to actually go out and identify what is the good work that's being done and to build allyship so if you look at I think right now the most influential social um, social activist group of our time right now is black Twitter um, and all those relationships have been made online and I've met all of you online I've met you know I've been involved in very successful change dot or campaigns because I went online and built built allies so I think that's what's you know important to consider there's change.org has amazing influence and it's very easy to do um, creating groups of affinity groups around certain things you know I'm part of Brave Girls Alliance they've done some good work in changing the media and the way it portrays girls media um, providing support for people who are doing amazing things that elevates their voices and hopefully that will actually have the mainstream media pick up those messages so you look at something like um, I don't know her, her last name but her first name is Debbie the woman who created um, uh, Goldie Blocks she got a lot of support 
and then next thing you know, gets a, um, a Super Bowl ad. So our mainstream media right now is being highly influenced by what's happening online. And I think that, you know, you do start small, but it, it, it is, it doesn't happen overnight. And you can easily plug into a campaign right now. So the easiest thing to do is just start researching things that you are, are passionate about, things that impact you. I think that's probably how um, Allison got involved with Audios Barbie, you know. And I, we've, we have had tons of people uh, intern with us and learn and grow because they simply just did a search. And so I think that luckily activism is at our fingertips, but it's important not to get mired in the first stage, which is awareness raising and um, the sharing of frustration and anger over a social situation, um, to realize that there are other steps beyond that. Mm -hmm. um, and really celebrate successes. Look at the Grammys last night. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was groundbreaking things happening around different voices being heard. Um, and that wouldn't have happened, I think, as quickly without access to social media and, and these producers getting an idea of what's important to the people watching. Yeah, I think I, I totally agree, and I feel like we're at a moment where we are seeing more positive messages, and we are seeing, um, you know, I, I would hope a sea change as far as you know more body positivity, um, and really, you know, keep. I think it's so important for us to keep the momentum going, and also again that that issue of leadership and you know, make me being seeing ourselves as media makers and um, not being overwhelmed by the negativity and seeing the potential for change I think is so so key and all of you have really highlighted that and stressed that um, you know I, I want to talk about one more thing that we haven't I mean, we, we started off talking about some of the the toxic messages around health and you know the influence of diet culture on the epidemic of disordered eating and poor body image you know, is there a way, you know, how do you see the responsibility of media in terms of promoting more positive messages about body image and health and fitness? You know, is it possible to do that? I know, Allison, you talked about, um, you know, this slippery slope of Fitspo and all of this kind of stuff where, you know, things are sort of framed in a way that's healthy, maybe not so healthy, but, you know, how can we actually shift the conversation and get more positive messages about health, weight, and body image out there, and, you know, what are the important ways to do that in, in each of your opinions? Because I think it, you know, it can be a tricky area, but I think it's really important for us to explore it in this, in this field. I, I think, personally, I also work on a project called She Heroes, and we profile exceptional women for who they are, not what they look like. And I think we can call on the media to start doing that, mm -hmm. highlighting stories and experiences of people regardless of what they look like. Mm -hmm. Because we have to start asking and requiring that it not be about what you look like. Last week we had the first plus size model on Sports Illustrated. That's a great stride, but at the same time it's still focusing on what the person looks like. She still is, she now can be sexy. She has a beautiful face. She has an hourglass figure. It's still, it's still focusing on the appearance as opposed to who she is. Like, I don't know anything about her. I might, I'd rather be inspired by the things she's done in life or maybe the stories and things she's overcome than to aspire to look like her. And we have to try to ask the media and create our own media where the stories are at the forefront. And that's really a challenge to Hollywood because Hollywood is, one of the biggest perpetrators of perpetuating the image over content of women in, in particular, and men too, actually. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah, that's actually a really Im important point that you raised because, you know, oftentimes body image issues and eating disorders are really defined, and certainly that um, stereotype is perpetuated by, by the media that these are women's issues and girls' issues, and we know um, you know, we're hearing from more and more boys and men who are struggling with body image issues and eating disorders, and, you know, that is that experience is not reflected in mainstream media. And also, we have more and more 
you know, men's magazines on the market, more and more pressure for guys to, you know, meet this ideal as well. So, you know, I think it's really important um, to to challenge that and not and to move away from the idea that these are, you know, girls and women's issues. Definitely. And even if you um, if you are media literate, I'm starting to notice how boys are being pressured to be muscular mm -hmm. and learning the tools that that actually is something that boys are being in impacted at school they're being bullied for being fat you know same as same as girls so it is a it's a real issue that we have to be aware of yeah absolutely um others who wanted to we we, were, we started talking about the you know the messages around health and is it pop, what is important as far as reframing this conversation and you know what are the what are your challenges to mainstream media um, Allison Melissa do you have anything to add to that yeah um, I was kind of thinking about what Pia was bringing up about the importance of putting on beauty and appearance and I think it's really concerning the way that the mainstream media is conflating beauty and appearance with health and we mentioned this earlier that if you're thin and you're muscular and you fit the societal definition of beauty then you must be healthy and we're putting the same equal amount of importance on both health and beauty. And from my perspective, beauty is a personal perception that really doesn't matter to the mainstream media what I find beautiful and what isn't. And I also find that health is the same way, that health, my health is entirely my business. And that should be something between me and my doctor and not between me and magazine ads and reality TV shows that are twisting these messages into giving me advice that's not helpful. So personally, I would like to see all reality TV shows based around people getting more healthy just thrown off of network television <laughs> because <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a personal journey to what makes you healthy and what is good for me and what makes me feel good. It's not going to be the same as what's good for anybody else. Sometimes my body wants to stay in bed for eight hours, and that's not going to be on anybody's reality show, but it's important to take care of yourself mentally and physically. And we very rarely see health being taken in moderation, health being taken as something you should do on your own based on what feels good for you. And it's all this very one-size-fits-all, eat this, work out this way, look this way, and you'll be happy journey. And I think that health has gotten so twisted in the media that it just really pays to take a step back and think, all right, what will actually help me feel better today personally, not what I'm being told will make me look good and then by extension feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that those things are, are necessarily connected. And then, of course, you've got this huge profit web behind all of these reality shows that you know paint this very... Um, narrow picture of what health is, which isn't actually healthy at all, um, and you know often can mimic the voice of the eating disorder. And we've had, um, you know, we had one of our proud to be me contributors write about that very thing. You know, of how triggering she found the Biggest Loser, and you know how it really reminded her of of her experience, you know, and struggling with an eating disorder. So you know, these very damaging toxic, yeah. Yeah, I mean, The Biggest Loser, I think, was, it was my biggest trigger show a couple of years ago. I couldn't watch it, and now it just makes me so angry I won't turn it on. But there was also, during the Super Bowl, that Weight Watchers put out a commercial that was trying to say how you should, you don't have to eat this, you don't have to think about this food, you don't need to do all of this. And it was, it was the inner monologue of an eating disorder put to a diet and weight loss commercial, and it was just really unnerving how that's being framed in the media as something that's healthy is to mm -hmm. be afraid of food and to fear being way more than someone who doesn't even know you says that you should. Yeah, and I, I think that the whole dialogue around health and weight loss and the fact that it's it's so automatically assumed that weight loss should be looked at as a as a solution and you know the dieting is presented as a solution to a problem rather than as we know um, you know a potential root of the problem now again dieting is not the same as an eating disorder but we do know um, that many people who develop eating disorders started out on diets and you know diets can pro progress to disordered eating so you know I think that 
to, to see that dieting and to see that message of dieting constantly in the media um, does have a, a real direct connection to the epidemic of disordered eating. So, you know, I think that, that your reaction, I had the same reaction to that ad. I found it incredibly offensive. So I think we do need to keep challenging that and keep challenging the diet culture within this field. It's very important. I want to add something, which is there's also the media portrayal of doctors. Mm -hmm. So we have shows like The Doctors and Dr. Oz, and they are portrayed as legal, license-holding doctors, and their shows are all about plastic surgery, dieting. It's not actually about health, um, and I think that that's something that needs to change um, mm -hmm. because not only are these doctors we look at as experts telling us through the media that we should chop off parts of our body and we'll be healthier, this is now adding weight to doctors in the, the regular world who don't quite know all about what makes a healthy person. A lot of doctors judge people just by their BMI, and that's a totally inaccurate single indicator of someone's health. Other factors are part of that. But often doctors just say, well, what's your BMI? My doctor has a chart of BMI in his office. You know, it's just, so I think that there's this collapse of medicine with um, popular culture that needs to be unraveled. Yeah, agreed, 100%. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's for entertainment purposes, it's connected to profit, you know, it's all of these things that we need to look very critically at. And, um, you know, certainly this connection between, again, between diet culture and plastic surgery and all of these, you know, quick fix um, kinds of shows and messages that we're seeing all the time, constantly in media, need to be challenged on a consistent basis. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here. <laughs> I think uh, we're going to, um, unfortunately, have to wrap it up, but I do want to give each of you the opportunity um, you know, to share something in case we, we didn't hit on your important points. I think we, we have um, definitely covered a, most of what we set out to here, but in case there's something else, I just want to give each of you a chance to um, say some, some closing remarks, and then um, I want to share some resources with everyone. So, um, Melissa, do you want to um, share some final words with our audience? I would love to. So, I think in closing and kind of going off of the conversation we just had about media, I think it's um, really important to think about who owns the media and who is benefiting from the insecurities that the media creates in you. And something that I think we forget and something that's a big tenet of media literacy is thinking about the money that is behind the media and the money that is behind you feeling bad about yourself. And I think that once we kind of that like light kind of gets switched on, that we realize that we're being manipulated for capitalism, I think that makes a really big difference in the way that people start consuming media. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is helpful in becoming a little bit more critical. Um, yeah. Thanks, Melissa. Very important point. Can't say that one enough. Um, Did you ask me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it dropped out. Um, I, I guess I, I want to say that no matter how alone or desperate or in a, in a disorder situation eating, of eating, there's always some resource online that can help you. And to be very aware, as Allison pointed out, when you are seeking information to perpetuate your suffering and when you are seeking information to empower yourself. And if you can get that distinction when you're in the moment, that will change your life. Because there are resources out there, there are blogs and there are campaigns and there are, you know, there are people on YouTube who can help you heal. And activism is a great way to do it, sharing your story. 
taking away the silence that creates shame around what you're going through is a big part of healing. Thank you so much. I, I think that is so, so crucial and so important to hold on to that hope and of what you're, where you are in the moment when you're looking for certain media, but to know that there's support out there. You know, there are resources. There is hope. Um, Allison, I want to um, pass it over to you. Any final comments for this Hangout? Sure. Um, well, I know that we talked a lot about media literacy in this Hangout, and that sounds like a really academic, fancy term that you need all kinds of, you need a PhD to understand what all these secret messages in the media are. It's a tendency to just kind of make it sound more difficult than it is, but really all that all I think that's really necessary to start looking critically at the media is to just ask yourself questions while you consume it. Who's making this media? What's the message they're trying to say? How is it making me feel and why am I feeling that way? It's all just being awake and being aware while you look at it instead of just taking it as it is. And even though it sometimes feels a lot of the time like you're not making a difference, even just by doing that, just by saying, who is making this image and why does it make me feel bad about myself and why is someone out there trying to make me feel bad about myself, that in and of itself is empowering to you and to anybody you talk about it with, it's empowering to them as well. So it's just a series of really small steps that you can do immediately after you stop watching this hangout, you go turn on the TV, like you might be doing anyway, and just be saying, this is really strange. Why does this make me feel weird? And already, that's, that's a difference, and that's a daily practice that can just add up into a, a world of change for everybody. Thank you so much. I... One thing our you can hashtag we are really um, trying to spread awareness about eating disorders and all of the complex factors that contribute to disordered eating and eating disorders. And um, this week we are really hoping to have a huge presence on social media and to share this knowledge. Um, so you can use the need awareness hashtag. Um, we also have a lot of great, great resources on our website related to media literacy. And you know, as all of our panelists pointed out, um, you know, media literacy might sound like a scary academic term, but this is something that you all, each and every one of you, can do. Um, you know, to look critically at the media and to take some action, to take some concrete steps towards positive change. And that's what we're all about. Um, on the website, we have our media literacy toolkit. Um, which is available for download at mindmedia.org. Um, we also have a program called Media Watchdog. Um, it's an opportunity for anyone. If you see a media website, actual pain having ads taken off the air. And on the flip side, as several panelists pointed out today, we're also about applauding companies that are getting it right. You know, that's a big part of this of this picture too. We really want to make sure that we're calling out companies who are really making an effort to, to bring about positive change. Um, I also, of course, want to acknowledge the great, great resources that our panelists um, have developed. Pia um, and Allison Adios Barbie is a fantastic, fantastic resource. Um, so many amazing stories shared. Um, so many great resources there for um, eating disorder recovery, body positivity, diversity. Um, really, really excellent resource and everyday feminism as well. Um, please check out these resources. Um, we'll have them available for all of you. And of course, I want to thank our panelists, Allison, Melissa, Pia. You guys are rock stars um, just doing such important work in the field and um, shared so many, so many important things all. And next time, if resources or help, um, please visit needawareness.org. You can also call us on our helpline, 1-800-931-2237. Um, just reiterating what Pia said, recovery is possible, hope is out there, help is out there, we're here for you. Thank you.